Hey, Dad, how come they're taking the Cosby show off the air? Because Mr. Cosby wanted to stop before the quality suffered. Quality schmality. If I had a TV show, I'd run that sucker into the ground. SpongeBob SquarePants is a television show that at this point needs no introduction. We're getting one anyways, but you know, I just thought I'd clarify. Created by marine biologist Steven Hillenberg, what once started as an educational self-produced comic series eventually was given the chance to blossom into its own cartoon series on Nickelodeon. Running for three seasons between 1999 and 2004, SpongeBob quickly became not only one of Nickelodeon's most popular programs, but a critically acclaimed cultural phenomenon enjoyed by children and adults alike. A lot of this comes down to just how well-written the show used to be. It may sound odd if you didn't grow up with it, but the original run of Spongebob honestly goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with classic Simpsons in its ability to just cram memorable joke after joke into every second of an episode. The pacing was immaculately tight, the plots were consistently creative, and most importantly it was one of those rare kid shows that didn't talk down to its audience. It's one of the reasons I can still go back to those original episodes as an adult and enjoy them just as much as I did as a child, if not more. After production of season 3 wrapped up, Steven Hillenberg and his crew got to work on the critically acclaimed 2004 Spongebob movie, which was fully intended to be the series finale. Steven personally wanted the series to end here, as he felt that Spongebob had done everything it needed to and he didn't want it getting ran into the ground to the point where people were actively begging for it to be taken off of the air. Man, it'd be a shame if that happened. Yeah, Nickelodeon and their parent company Viacom saw just how much of a cash cow this little yellow phenomenon could be. And so production continued on not only without Steven Hillenberg, but also without most of the original crew that made the show what it was. As the story goes, SpongeBob quickly began to decline in quality. And within the course of about one to two seasons, it had completely devolved into a lethargic, unfunny shell of what it once was. All of the wit, pacing, and humor went down the toilet, and the show became a stale, gross, creatively bankrupt and at times, boringly unwatchable kids show. Yes, I am still bitter about it, how could you tell? By now this is a story that's been told billions of times before, as there's likely thousands of video essays on YouTube talking about what caused Spongebob's decline in quality. But there's one piece of the puzzle that I rarely, if ever, hear get brought up, and that's the sound design. The score of a typical Spongebob episode is, in my opinion, one of the show's greatest strengths and most defining features. And while it may not be the first thing you think of when it comes to Spongebob, it certainly has left an unconscious impact on anybody who grew up with it. And if you didn't grow up with it, well, I guess as long as you weren't a Discovery Family kid, we're chill. Now obviously every television show uses sound cues and music tracks, it's just the natural part of video making in any medium. But have you ever stopped to think about just how well Spongebob executes its background music? Like the fact that most of you watching this could hum the Krusty Krab music if I asked you to, is a testament to just how genius Spongebob's sound design actually was. Whether it's making trap remixes out of it, sampling it in real songs, or re-editing historical footage with it, people love to celebrate the iconic background music from Spongebob. Take the track Grass Skirt Chase, for example, often used when something hectic is going on or the characters are being chased around. It's been used in so many goddamn meme edits that it has its own dedicated page on the prestigious, peer-reviewed academic journal KnowYourMeme.com. That's how you know it's culturally important. You just don't see this kind of thing with background music from the Fairly Odd Parents or Jimmy Neutron, do you? No, you don't, and if you think you do, you're a stinky little liar. Background music in Spongebob has left an impact on popular culture almost as strong as the actual content of the episodes. And believe it or not, most of it was actual genuine music recorded long before the show's inception. Unlike other cartoons, most of the music used in the original run of Spongebob wasn't actually recorded specifically for the show. Instead, the sound design team opted to mainly score it using stock compositions all recorded between the 1960s and the 1990s. I think this is part of what gave Spongebob such a unique vibe early on. Those iconic Hawaiian tracks that gave the series such a distinct flavor were mostly real-life recordings made by authentic musicians, sometimes decades prior to the series' premiere. This also extends to the pirate shanties that defined Mr. Krabs and the Krusty Krab, as well as the country instrumentals that defined Sandy, the chill stock elevator music, and perhaps most importantly, the surf rock that gave early Spongebob a lot of its identity. Surf rock was one of the most prominent genres of early Spongebob music, and like most of its other scores, these tracks were all recorded by J. 
genuine surf bands from the 80s and 90s. Most notable of these bands were the Surf Dusters, whose 1989 album Save the Waves would serve as a basis for a lot of early Spongebob music. Twelve songs from this album were heavily featured throughout the first three seasons of Spongebob, which is kind of insane when you think about it. This was a real commercial album that came out almost a decade prior to Spongebob's first episode. Yet watching those first three seasons, the music fits in so naturally that you'd never even think so many of the background tracks came from a commercial rock band. You know, unless you're like me and you hyper fixate on production music from children's cartoons. <laughs> I'm okay. Their usage already started to fall by the wayside as early as season three, but man, they're all over those first two seasons and it's just something that's super fascinating to me. Much like the show itself, music in early Spongebob never felt like it was talking down to its audience. Whereas other cartoons had wacky or slapsticky scores made specifically for moments in the episode, Spongebob's music often felt vibey or altogether transcendental. That isn't to say there was no original music made for it at all, as there were actually quite a few common tracks in those early seasons that were created by series composers like Nicholas Carr or Sage Guyton. You can usually tell if a song was composed specifically for the show, because it tends to sound a little bit goofier than the stock tracks do, but these were used sparingly enough that in my opinion they only really helped to strengthen the scenes they were used in. They're equally memorable in their own right. Those original three seasons of Spongebob are filled to the brim with iconic background music, beloved and remembered by those all around the world who grew up with the show. But much like my mental sanity, the sound design slowly began to deteriorate in the seasons following following the departure of most of the original crew. Season 4 of Spongebob starts to fall off in quality almost immediately in my opinion. The only opinion that matters, may I remind you. But one thing it does have going for it, besides, you know, not being unwatchable, is that they manage to keep the sound design mostly intact from those earlier seasons. I don't blame people who still associate Season 4 with the classic run of the show, since its earlier episodes share the same sound design as the first three. As the season progressed, however, they began to slowly phase out a lot of the stock music music, and began replacing those tracks with original background music composed specifically for the show. These new tracks tended to feel a lot more obnoxious, goofy, and slapsticky than even the original compositions made for the earlier seasons, and they lacked the authenticity that made Spongebob's sound design what it was. The music in Spongebob began to feel like cheap, sometimes downright childish pastiches of the genres it once genuinely honored, and they felt tailor-made to fit the more childish and obnoxious tone the show developed after the movie. This trend continued to increase increased throughout seasons 5 and 6, and by the time season 7 rolled around, woof. By this point, most of the remaining stock tracks were phased out as the show began to rely more and more on original background music. While most of the old iconic tracks have popped up here and there in recent years, they aren't used consistently anymore. In fact, from what I can tell online, commenters on the Spongebob wiki almost treat it like an event when an old track does show up for the first time in over a decade. As far as I can tell, there's never really been any solid reasoning given as to why these old tracks have been phased out. But if I had to guess, based on what I've researched over the years, it seems that the sound design team probably were tired of their music licenses expiring every couple of years, and instead decided to fill their sound library with original music that they fully owned. This makes sense, as we know for a fact that many of the original background music licenses from early Spongebob started to expire around the mid-2000s. Wow, it's almost like Spongebob wasn't meant to be milked for decades beyond its inception. The end result of all of this has been Spongebob transforming into a nearly unrecognizable show compared to where it began. Well, technically there's a billion reasons Spongebob turned into a very different show, but the music has always been one of the biggest losses in its identity to me. Even as a kid, I noticed that the sound design in the newer episodes that were coming out completely lacked the same charm as the older episodes. Especially in conjunction with the show itself just losing all of its charm. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, growing up with late-stage Spongebob was frustrating, to say the least. If you tune in to watch a newer episode, you'll notice that the sound design is almost entirely composed of original music that was introduced from late season 4 onwards, with maybe one or two tracks from the original seasons popping up per episode if you're lucky, and it does give off a very different vibe. Not that I've watched a new episode in years, mind you, but luckily, the Spongebob wiki lists the production music used in every single episode, so if you're a nutjob like me that's interested in what I'm saying for some godforsaken reason, it's a good resource to check out. To really drill home the point I'm trying to make, I'm going to show a few different back-to-back -back clips of music from early Spongebob alongside corresponding music from the post-movie seasons, and I think you'll be able to see what I mean when I say the sound design became way more cartoonish and goofy compared to the more genuine chill vibe the original soundtrack had. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, admittedly, this is all just my opinion. If you're somebody that, for some godforsaken reason, prefers the sound design of newer SpongeBob episodes, that's valid. I, I guess. But to me, there was really something lost when the background music in Spongebob became just so over the top and goofy and zany, because those original tracks from the first three seasons really are what gave the show its identity. To wrap this up, I wanted to cover a couple of well-known background tracks from Spongebob that have been mostly abandoned in recent years. So if you're a functioning adult that doesn't look into these things, uh... Get your shocked Pikachu face ready. First up is the iconic Krusty Krab theme, the Tip Top Polka. Everyone knows this track, it's iconic, it's essentially synonymous with the Krusty Krab, but during early season seven, it was replaced with the much inferior Jovial Pirates Jig. Yeah, I'm not much of a fan of this one. It was only used two more times after that in Season 9, and as of recording this video, it has not been used in the show in over seven goddamn years. This exact same phenomenon also applies to the other Krusty Krab theme, the Rake Hornpipe, which was sort of like a secondary track that was used a lot for the Krusty Krab and for Mr. Krabs and things like that. Anyways, this track was also mostly retired after Season 6 only having shown up four times since then. Although its last appearance has at least been a little bit more recent, having last shown up in some random 2019 episode. Next up, we have the iconic credits theme, which ironically, I'm sure a lot of you don't even recognize as the credits theme because cable television kind of stopped showing credits around the mid 2000s. You definitely will still recognize this song as it was used all the time in the first three seasons of SpongeBob. This track was sort of used as a theme song for SpongeBob's character and was likely the first original song composed specifically for the show, seeing as it was made for the credits. And yeah, throughout the original run, it was used all the time in the episodes, super memorable, super iconic, I'm sure we all recognize it. Unfortunately, this track has had it much more rough than the Krusty Krab themes, seeing as it was only used three more times in season four before disappearing entirely until the season six special Truth or Square, and it's not been used in the 14 years since then. Earlier, I mentioned the Surf Dusters album Save the Waves, which has had nearly every track on it used in the first three seasons of Spongebob, most of them only appearing once or twice, but there are a handful of them that have appeared frequently throughout those first three seasons. The Surf Dusters were entirely absent from season four, but were at least used one more time in season five, and two more times in season six, before being abandoned for the entire rest of the series. The last song of theirs to ever be used was the track Surf Buggy which was sort of used as a Gula Goo theme in early season one before being replaced with the much more recognizable track Stars and Games. Speaking of, Stars and Games has not been used since season three. RIP. <laughs> there was apparently an alternate version of it used in some random 2019 episode, but uh, yeah, other than that, RIP to the best Gula Goo theme. Okay, this next one is a personal one but let's talk about the track, The Mob. This track was often used as the theme song for when the police showed up, and man, is it a bop. It surprisingly wasn't used a whole lot in the original run of SpongeBob, only showing up in the season one episode, Hall Monitor, before returning for two more episodes in season three. It actually showed up a bit more frequently in the early post-movie seasons, but starting in season seven, they replaced it with a brand new original track called Bikini Bottom Police Theme and boy does it suck balls in comparison. Like, this shit pissed me the fuck off as a kid. As you can hear right now, it's a very similar track, uh, the bass line being the exact same pretty much, but the horns just never come in, so it has this very empty feeling to it, like you're just waiting for something that's never going to come. Every time a new episode came on as a kid and this track showed up, I always just got so frustrated because it was like, you know, why are only half the instruments playing? I want to hear the horn section. Give me the horn section. Uh, turns out that wasn't the case, they just replaced the original with a hollow imitation. For shame. Okay, last song I want to talk about is Nostalgic Hawaii, which was another commonly used track from the early seasons of Spongebob. This one just gives off such a pure and innocent energy to it, which I think mainly comes down to the fact that it was used so frequently in the early seasons of Spongebob, but stopped being used almost immediately after the movie. It was only used one time briefly in season five, but hasn't been heard since. And honestly, tracks like these are my favorite category, because they're entirely untainted by all of the bad episodes that came out after the movie. It would take far too long for me to sit here and talk about every single Spongebob track that's been abandoned over the years because 
if quite frankly it's most of them. <laughs> but if you're interested, I've linked in the description a video playlist I made on my second channel, consisting of 20 Spongebob tracks that have either been entirely or mostly abandoned after the movie. So if you're curious to see what other tracks have been abandoned, I'd go check that out. Anyways, I, I feel like I've rambled on long enough about the background music in some kid's cartoon, uh, so I'm gonna cut things here before people start to think I'm even more crazy than I actually am. So I'm gonna go get some professional help, uh, and if you've made it this far into a video about Spongebob background music, you probably need some too. So in the words of the great Sheldon J. Plankton, Goodbye everyone, I'll remember you all in therapy.